Hi there. Thanks so much for joining me today for the latest episode of Impact Real Estate Investing. My guest today is John Fallon, Head of the Department of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas. John is probably best known for his recent work in Pittsburgh as founder of the Urban Design Build Studio. He has used design processes to work with underrepresented communities on the development and implementation of a variety of interesting projects. And in 2011, he co-founded Project RE, also in Pittsburgh, which was geared towards creating entrepreneurial opportunities for local communities with a three-part mission. Reuse materials, rebuild communities, and restore lives by teaching trade skills to help people secure a living wage. Be sure to go to evepicker.com to find out more about John on the show notes page for this episode. And be sure to sign up for my newsletter so you can access information about impact real estate investing and get the latest news about the exciting projects on my crowdfunding platform, Small Change. Hello, John. It's just lovely to be able to chat with you today. It's great to speak with you, too. Yeah, it's been way too long. It's been a while. So you are now the head of the School of Architecture um, at the University of Arkansas. But I've known you, I knew you through your tenure at Kennedy Mellon University and saw you launch um, the Urban Design Build Studio there. It's pretty rare to meet an architect and teacher who's so squarely focused on public interest and equity. And I wanted you to tell me a little bit about the Urban Design Build Studio and the goals you have there. Well, the the Urban Design Build Studio is still alive and well, actually. uh, I've carried it with me to uh, the University of Arkansas and it's uh, now at the Faye Jones School of Architecture. We're on the initial phases of uh, the first project down here uh, with promises of uh, uh, many more to come. Um, even in the context of the, the changes that we're experiencing with the pandemic. Um, the, the focus of the Urban Design Build Studio is really to uh, focus on public interest design issues. The clear objective is to uh, use collective intelligence so that the work benefits from the perspectives of uh, multiple entities, multiple individuals and people of multiple expertise. And what we're trying to do is develop uh, work, so that tangible outcomes, uh, tangible impact uh, is replicable um, and appropriate for uh, the circumstances being addressed. So uh, it's quite often that urban design built studio projects start uh, without having an idea of what the project is, but they, they emerge more organically out of conversations with um, Uh, community stakeholders and community leaders. So tell us a little bit about the first project that you're doing there, or maybe a past project that you did in Pittsburgh, but one that you think is really um, a good example of what you're trying to do. I think probably the best example of the one in Pittsburgh, and and then I can talk about what we're starting to do here. The the projects in Pittsburgh uh, have ranged in scope from a fabrication facility to a cafe to housing proposals and uh, all sorts of projects in between mobile advocacy um, projects as well. Um, Probably the one that demonstrates um, the underpinnings of the urban design built studio best would be uh, cafe 524, which is now the uh, everyday cafe. Um, that project was initiated with uh, Everyday Cafe. I'm sorry. Yeah, what? the Everyday Cafe, okay. which is uh, right there on uh, North Homewood uh, Avenue uh, in Homewood. And um, that project emerged out of a, a chance introduction to uh, Dr. John Wallace, who's at the University of Pittsburgh and is a uh, native of the Homewood neighborhood, uh, in working with students. Uh, of the suggestion of the Urban Redevelopment Authority. We started working in Homewood and and started with some community engagement, Um, met Dr. Wallace and 
really focused on this notion of a third place. And uh, he had put together a group of people who were interested in uh, establishing a third place and a business opportunity for local residents and uh, put together a team with Operation Better Block and obtained a license agreement for the property and then um, ultimately stuck with that project. And Dr. Wallace is, uh, has now run that facility for about three years. So that's the type of project that probably best exemplifies uh, an organic path to coming up with something that's meaningful and sustainable for a community. A little bit of background for our listeners. So Homewood is one of the neighborhoods that kind of suffered most, I think, when Pittsburgh lost half its population and really hasn't come back. I don't know about, I don't know the demographic numbers there, maybe you do, but it's very poor. Yeah, it's, it's one of the most economically challenged uh, neighborhoods in the city, um, if not the most, uh, depending on the sector of the, the uh, neighborhood that you look at. It, is, it demonstrates the, the most challenged characteristics in terms of median income levels. So there are a number of factors that the significance of that project and the significance of having those stakeholders who are really invested in the community and, and want to sustain something. So, you know, the work of the Urban Design Build Studio, we're bringing design services to a group of individuals who may not have had access to those services otherwise and achieve something that they might not achieve otherwise. Um, and by virtue of affiliations with a research university, there's an opportunity to spend uh, longer periods of time uh, in working on the projects with those stakeholders that might be uh, possible in a traditional uh, market rate scenario. So your projects then are in pretty um, underserved neighborhoods where people are in serious need economically or affordable homes or any variety of, of those options, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you also launched Project RE in Pittsburgh, and I don't know if you took that with you as well, but what was that about? Project RE was a way to expand the efforts of uh, the Urban Design Build Studio. Um, I'm still the executive director of Project RE. Um, Project RE was focused to address regional issues uh, in Allegheny County and Pittsburgh, um, focusing on uh, restoring community, rebuilding lives, and reuse of materials. So um, it was a uh, transactional entity and a physical space that uh, has been put together to bring design expertise, use of materials that are extracted from building deconstruction uh, associated with blight that exists uh, in Pittsburgh, and then uh, involve uh, efforts of uh, job skill training in the creation of the projects. So it's uh, the, the space is about 20,000 square feet in size. There's a large community uh, meeting uh, center. There's a gallery in there. There's a small studio. There's a uh, industrial fabrication shop that has uh, CNC technology as well as a wood shop. And then there's an assembly area and welding training centers. Wow. Since 2000. Well, that's been the main working space for the Urban Design Build Studio in Pittsburgh. Um, and we plan to use that space uh, now that I'm, I'm in Arkansas as the uh, head of the Fred Jones School. Um, the intention is to use that space in the summers for design build projects uh, with a number of universities from around the country and potentially around the globe. Uh, to work on projects that are uh, uh, more targeted in nature and, and bring people to Pittsburgh. And then during the year, we're planning um, moving forward to have a series of uh, fabricators and um, artists and residents uh, who work on projects and initiatives that they're interested in. It's pretty extensive. So how, how do you hope these initiatives will impact architecture and architects as citizens in general? This is, this is not what most architecture schools do, right? <laughs> no, it's not. But I, I think that there's, a, there's been a growing awareness of it. I would say it's become much more common now. Um, there's a much greater awareness of uh, the benefit that, that people can have. Um, I think that, you know, when we talk statistically, 
if you reference the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum exhibition from a number of years ago, they, you know, they always talk about the other 98%, uh, that 2% of uh, the population can afford to uh, use the services of an architect. That statistic is not really correct. The, the language more precisely should be 2% two, two of the population elect to use the services of an architect. And so if we take a look at that, that 98% sector is enormous. There's a large portion of that sector that uh, simply don't value design. Um, and so there needs to be uh, greater awareness. I used to always say that people would spend more time picking the sneakers they'd buy than choosing an architect, right? It's true. Yeah, they will. Uh, there's, and so there's a culture that has to be cultivated around that and, and an appreciation for that. So the intent here is not that every student emerges uh, wanting to be a contractor, wanting to build their own work, or um, that they uh, pursue public interest design as a um, full-time endeavor, but it's more that we're elevating their awareness, more that we are helping them to become better citizens, helping them to understand opportunities uh, and how to navigate uh, the context of projects to help innovative in ways that are appropriate and of impact to broader communities. You know, I've always thought that architectural training is really unique because it teaches these kids to take nothing and turn it into something in a very creative way. And it's a training in problem solving that I don't think I don't think you can really match in another profession, but maybe in engineering, but perhaps not so creatively there. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. I think that uh, it, it's an enormous skill set, um, and most of the students who are successful in, in migrating the whole way through a curriculum possess a, a great deal of passion, a great deal of persistence as well. And um, I think those sensibilities and those attributes become so important um, and I, I think that uh, we undervalue ourselves. Um, yeah, I agree. Quite clearly. And, you know, and it's interesting, too, this trend towards project-based learning uh, that has been adopted uh, across uh, academic circles. You know, it's, it's really interesting. That's been embedded in architectural education since its inception. And we never seem to value it, but now other academic uh, units uh, find enormous value in it. And it's something that's always been inherent to what we do. So, you know, you know, I'm an architect by training and I, I've morphed over the years into now I'm a fintech expert and who, who knew, but I would say that, you know, early on when I was young, I, I, I had a very hard time thinking about leaving architecture because it felt like a waste of training. But I've realized over the years that that was absolutely not true. And that training has, has helped me in innumerable ways. So, I, I wonder whether architecture schools are getting better at showing young architecture students the possibilities of what they can do with this training. They don't need to just go work for a, you know, a, a star architect somewhere, but there, there's sort of endless possibilities for what they can do. No, I, I think that uh, students emerging today are so much more aware. Um, I do think that schools are being far more successful in terms of providing opportunities to students that suggest the full spectrum of things that they might branch out uh, and, and might explore professionally uh, after they leave the academic setting. It's really interesting. I've, I've always been amazed at, at what you've accomplished. Uh, and I, I think in a way you're sort of the poster child for the wayward architect, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, but not really. You've always come back and you've been an advocate for design. And I think that that, I think where there's now a greater awareness of what architectural education can do is evidenced by um, programs that are not necessarily professional programs, like four-year programs that are really elevating the awareness of young individuals about the potency of design, what design has to offer. And, and what happens is uh, those people who graduate, say, with a, a Bachelor of Science that uh, will not position them for professional uh, licensure, they're emerging and entering other disciplines, allied disciplines and allied fields. Mm -hmm. Allied fields 
are as important as you know to the implementation of innovative work uh, as design. I mean, um, so yes, I think that the schools are much better now at getting students away from uh, navel gazing, you know, where you just sit in isolation and and try to develop things in isolation. I think that there's um, there's much more emphasis placed on collaboration, team building. I think you see that across the board. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fabulous. So as head of the architecture school there, what do you think is most vital now for the next generation of architecture students? And Well, I think it's probably the same thing that it's always been is agility. And I, I think uh, that's probably a lot of what we've been discussing uh, today is the the ability of somebody to adapt to a situation, to understand a situation, to bring different levels of expertise and, and to orchestrate uh, that expertise in a positive way. Um, it's also knowing when to be a soldier and when to be a leader. Um, and I, I think that, that those are important things, important, important sensibilities. And of course, with uh, climate change being such a significant factor, I mean, that, that has to be part of the conversation. Uh, we're starting to be much greater awareness uh, in the area of uh, social justice um, and equity. Um, that will need to continue as well. So I, I think, again, this training is a problem solver. It's, it's really just the critical thinking skills and being agile that, that you really want to have somebody emerge with. They don't feel that they're indoctrinated in a way that they're equipped with a series of tools that will allow them to adapt and grow and change yeah. as they move through their career. I'm jealous that they're learning that so young because it really wasn't a possibility when I went through school. Yeah, no, it's same for me. There was one way to do it and uh, you kind of had to find your way after you got out. We have to butt our heads against it, right? Yeah. So what's your background and what you've spent a life kind of fascinated with equity in architecture and in the physical environment. And I'm just wondering how you got there. Well, I'm uh, always proud to tell people that I'm from uh, Chicago, uh, if, if they're willing to ask and if they can't discern from my accent. <laughs> so I had, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also old enough that when I was young, uh, there were a number of significant buildings that were being constructed at the time. And, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, the opportunity to to see those buildings being built and was just fascinated by construction and the physical environment. And so I really can't remember a time where I did not want to be involved in architecture professionally. Uh, it was always a, an interest of mine and something that I thought would be a great privilege to be involved with. I think as I got older, I started to develop an interest in uh, affordable housing and equity just by virtue of uh, circumstance um, that I had growing up. Then my career took me about as far away from that as you can get. I went to work for a couple of star architects uh, and worked on large projects, uh, significant projects, and then um, was a principal for a, a large, well-known firm. And uh, when I, I hit a point in my career where I was not addressing things necessarily related to equity and, and not related to uh, issues in neighborhoods uh, that I felt needed help and uh, made it a, a sea change in my career and, and focused on nonprofit work and uh, in teaching as an extension of that. So that's kind of the path uh, yes. that, uh, I took. We know that you care about socially responsible real estate, but are there any current trends in real estate development that interest you the most? And perhaps the second question is, given what's going on with the coronavirus right now, how might architecture change to address things like pandemics and keeping people safe? Those are really interesting questions. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that you're asking it because the, the answer probably, well, it might have been the same a few weeks ago, but it's a lot that, you know, um, given the perspective that we all have at this time, of course, it's changed all of our perspectives. Um, things that are interesting in terms of real estate, I, I think that there's much greater awareness of how market rate development can be leveraged to advantage uh, mixed income um, development and, and provide 
an opportunity for communities where uh, fixed income residents can be part of a successful neighborhood. I think that there's an enormous amount of advocacy that is still needed with regard to that. Um, issues around gentrification, uh, I think people are, are very keenly aware of some of those issues, but a lot of what's perceived as gentrification is product, in fact, of misinformation many times, um, that there's a perception that somebody will be pushed out rather than understanding that there's a mechanism for uh, long-term residents to stay in an area. So I, I think advocacy there becomes really important. The things that small change is doing um, by allowing people to invest through crowdsource funding is incredibly important. Um, I, you know, the range of projects that you have uh, that are demonstrated through the, the website really illustrate the potency of uh, groups of people coming together to impact change in areas where people would probably be uh, risk averse in terms of uh, taking on opportunities. So those are probably the areas in development. In terms of response to the pandemic, I, I really am at a loss on that. Um, I, I am a little bit too, but I've been thinking a lot about small change and First and foremost, they have this tool that lets everyday people invest. And, and yet, you know, how many people filed for unemployment in one week this yeah. last week? You know, and I can't, I can't really kind of reconcile the two at the moment. I think we're going to have to wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, when I, I think um, with the pandemic, I think I probably... I haven't been thinking about it in terms of the investment side, um, but the point that you raise is, is really important. My, my mind tends to shift more towards the practicalities of one's physical health. Um, and then of course, I think of the work of mass and things that they've done with Dr. Farmer and um, yeah. just simple things. Uh, we, it's gonna, we're gonna see a, a, a sea of technological changes as to how you open doors. For example, yeah, really yeah no, that's, yes, it will. It will transform those things that we take for granted so fundamentally, yes. Yeah, it's a bit crazy. And, of course, that's having an impact on your school because the teamwork that is clearly really part of what you're doing has sort of been shot down at the moment, right, with the students and how they work together. Or has it Be finding other ways to do that? Well, we're still in the first uh, weeks. I think unfortunate, I think what struck me, um, you know, it's, it's interesting if I just relate a story when we made, when the university here made the announcement that they were going to distance learning and anybody who knows architects knows, uh, uh, understands the intensity of the, the um, educational process and the studio culture. The younger students in the school happened to be outside my office and I heard this eruption of laughter and, you know, they quite happy that they might gain relief from the demands of uh, the curriculum. And then um, when I went up to visit my studio, because I work with students who are further along in the, in the program, uh, the kids were in tears. And it was at that time that I really realized the impact that it's having on those who are emerging into the profession. They understood the gravity of the situation at that time um, by virtue of the fact that they understood that was probably going to be the last time they were going to see their classmates as a, a large group. That was, um, you know, the uh, celebrations of graduation were um, clearly going to be uh, suspended um, at least for a while. Uh, and then, immediate concerns over what it meant for the viability of their professional futures, uh, the immediate viability. So I think your perspective, depending on your age, changes uh, yes. yeah. Definitely. Uh, and your understanding of, of uh, the impact. Yeah. And then, you know, I asked the current trends question in other interviews and a month ago, you know, people are talking about co-working and this month, I have to wonder if co-working is dead, you know? <laughs> it's uh, very, very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult to imagine. Anyway, now we're down this depressing path, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think to think about it optimistically, you know, and going back to what we said, um, 
this is a wicked problem. Uh, and it's not a wicked problem. It, it is illuminating uh, thousands of wicked problems. And I, I think that um, the opportunities will emerge out of what we understand. And I, I think right now it's, it's so early in the process um, as we start to come out of this, as the virus is controlled and contained, um, and we start to plan uh, for the future, I, th I think that that will open up all sorts of avenues. But uh, what those are, I, I don't know, and I, I, I really haven't had time to speculate. But, you know, I think architects might be at the center of some solutions, I'm sure. So, yes. yeah, yeah. So, so it's actually a very interesting thought. How do you think we need to think about our cities and neighborhoods to build better places for everyone? Well, I think we've been on a, a rather positive trajectory. When I was a, you know, again, going back to when I was a child, when I was a child, uh, cities were horrible places. You didn't want to be in cities, uh, yeah. you know, unless you were really serious about uh, urbanism. Um, you avoided cities. And I, I think that the perceptions of cities really didn't start shifting until the early 90s. And it, it really hasn't been until I would say the last decade that we've seen the benefits of positive urban thinking and, and consideration of new models of development. Yeah, I think that the cities um, are making strides towards being much more inclusive in terms of uh, both social uh, and economic uh, platforms. Um, and so we still have to move the meter uh, a lot further in terms of uh, that. We still have, um, you know, there's still issues of segregation. There's still issues of economic disparity and concentrated poverty. Um, so I, I think that where urban uh, environments need to start moving is towards deconcentration of those uh, negative attributes. I think that it has gotten significantly better in, in recent history, and I think we were on a, a path forward there. Um, and again, I think crowdfunding uh, and supportive developments is a significant component to that uh, continued success in the future. I do think it's, it's interesting. We always talk about density being um, and then, of course, in cities like Pittsburgh, where there's been uh, population loss, you know, the term that was developed was right-sizing. I don't know if the pandemic is, is going to lead us to start thinking about what appropriate levels of density are or how that ties into the general uh, health and well-being. That, that's to be determined in the future. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm excited to see how you and your students put some thought to the post-pandemic problems and the future that we're all looking at. It's going to be really interesting to see. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. This has been a great conversation. Okay. Bye, John. Bye. All right. Bye, Eve. Thanks. That was John Follin, head of the Department of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas. John is an architect and teacher like no other I know. He frames his work around issues of the environment, social justice, and equity. Not only is his own body of work significant, but he is dedicated to teaching students to be the next generation of thoughtful architects, makers, and citizens. You can find out more about Impact Real Estate Investing and access the show notes for today's episode at my website, evepicker.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to find out more about how to make money in real estate while building better cities. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And thank you, John, for sharing your thoughts. We'll talk again soon. But for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change. <laughs>